Thessalonians chapter 1, God's going to give you double for your trouble. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and let's begin reading in verse 3. Paul says, We ought to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. As a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day that he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I have encouraging words to share with you this morning. I want you to just receive a shot of holy encouragement from the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's pray. Father, I just ask in Jesus' name that you'd breathe life among us. The letter kills, but the words you give are spirit and life, Lord. I pray that you just breathe a refreshing breath into us in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a word of encouragement from the Holy Spirit today. God is going to repay you double for your trouble. In the wee hours of the morning, an old minister slipped into eternity while he was sleeping. He found himself standing in a very long line in front of the pearly gates. He had stately silver hair and his clerical collar and his best black suit. Being that he had served God so faithfully his whole life, he was a little annoyed that he had to wait in such a long line. He kept craning his neck to see what was happening. Up ahead, he could see St. Peter handing people white robes and waving them one by one through the gates. Just in front of him was a New York City cab driver. He was dressed pretty shabbily, and he smelled like stale cigars. When they finally got up to the gate, Peter asked the cabbie his name and his occupation. Peter smiled, and he handed the cabbie a beautiful, shimmering white silk robe, a royal blue sash, fine satin slippers, and an ornate walking staff. The cabbie passed happily through the gates. The minister stepped up and announced himself very ceremoniously, sure that Peter would recognize him. Peter frowned and handed the old minister a plain white cotton robe, a rope for a belt, some crude sandals, and a twisted old walking stick. The minister was in complete shock. He said, I don't understand. He said, why did the cabbie get such a beautiful robe and I got this? Peter said to him, look, pal, up here we work on results. Every Sunday while you preached, people slept. But every day when he drove, people begged God for mercy. <laughs> Someday we will all receive our just rewards. A few weeks ago, we opened the very first letter ever written by Paul. It was addressed to the new Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica. We've been reading through the lines of this letter, listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us. You see, the letters of the New Testament are not ordinary letters. They are letters from heaven. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to Christians everywhere in every generation. Short while after Paul wrote the first letter, he wrote a second letter, a follow-up letter, 2 Thessalonians. One purpose was to clear up some confusion about the coming of the Lord, and the other purpose was really encouragement. 
These lines in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, they are pure encouragement. And looking at the verses, I hear some encouraging words that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to minister to you today. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit for you. First is this, believe it, God made the right call about you. Believe it, God made the right call about you. Paul writes, we owe it to God to give thanks for you. We have to give credit where credit is due to God. We have to say it. Your lives are evidence that God made the right call about you. What Paul says about the Christians in Thessalonica, the Holy Spirit is saying about you today. God made the right call about you. God made the right call when he called you out of your spiritual darkness and into his marvelous light. Beloved, can I tell you, you're not here worshiping Jesus today by chance. You're not even here by your own choice. You're here today because God called you. You're here today because God chose to extend his saving grace to you. God arranged the divine appointment for you to hear the good news about Jesus. It was a divine setup. You didn't have a chance. God gave you the ability to perceive. He gave you the faith to believe. He gave you the will to receive Jesus. God made the right call when he elected you to become the heir of this so great a salvation. He made the right call when he declared you justified through faith in Jesus. He made the right call when he declared you to be sanctified, one of his holy ones through the blood of Jesus and the washing of the word. He made the right call when he counted you worthy of the kingdom, when he called you son, when he called you daughter, when he made you part of his own family. He made the right call call when he destined you to someday behold him face to face and to live forever in the blazing light of his glorious presence, God made the right call about you. A while back ago, there were these hilarious commercials about a guy trying White Castle hamburgers for the very first time. And the minute he tasted White Castle, he was instantly hooked. He was instantly in love. He, he couldn't get enough White Castle. And the voice says, as he's ravenously eating these hamburgers, the voice says, yeah, he's one of ours. <laughs> Do you know, that's exactly what happened when God saw you. The Father looked at the Son. The Son looked at the Holy Spirit. They nodded and they said in unison, Yeah, He's one of ours. She's one of ours. And God was right about you because you loved Him from the very first taste of Him that you got. You can't get enough of Him. God made the right call about you. He wasn't wrong about you in the least. Maybe you're not sure whether you really should believe that. Maybe some people who have known you for a long time can't believe that you are all churchified now. <laughs> they can't believe that you spend hours every week in church. No way. You? Really? You got to be kidding. They can't believe that you actually, your stingy old self actually gives more than 5 or $10 in the offering every week. They might think this is just a fad with you. Oh, yeah. Last year you wanted to be a vegan. The, the year before that, it was Irish step dancing. The year before that, it was Tai Chi. I know you, this won't last. Maybe your family thinks you have gone completely out of your mind. You know, you're in good company because Jesus' earthly family, they thought that about him for a while. Maybe sometimes you struggle with some, own doubt, with some doubts of your own. Lord, I'm not really sure that I can do this. Lord, are you sure you got the right guy? Are you sure you tapped the right woman on the shoulder? When Peter realized out on his boat who Jesus really was, he fell down on his knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Maybe we feel the same way sometimes. Lord, you can't possibly want me. Why would you want me? But beloved, listen, receive a word of encouragement from the Holy Spirit. God made the right call about you. And I have some evidence to prove it. How do I know God made the right call about you? Well, I know because, for one thing, your faith is growing more and more. Paul had to give credit 
where credit to God was due. The Thessalonian believers were growing in their faith more and more, and that was solid evidence that God had made the right call. And the same is true for you too. Every day, your faith is making progress. Every day, you're becoming more and more convinced that God's way is right, that God's word is true, that God's wisdom is purest and best. Every passing month, you're trusting him more and more. You're surrendering to him more and more. You're following his lead more and more. You're leaning on him more and more. You see, you're growing in your faith. You're not the same as you were a month ago. You're not the same as you were a year ago. You're not the same as you were a decade ago. Oh, you're not yet all that you want to be, but you're sure not what you used to be. Take a look around and see. You have come a long way, baby. That's evidence that God made the right call about you. How do I know? God made the right call about you. Your faith is growing more and more. Another thing, your love is increasing more and more. It was true of the Thessalonian believers, and it's true of you too. You love God more than you used to. You know, there was a time when God was very distant to you. You didn't think of him very much, or you didn't think very much of him. You avoided God, thought he was angry, thought that he needed to be appeased, thought that he was impossible to please, but now you feel completely different about him. Now your heart is overflowing with love for God. You're drawn to Him. You want to know everything you can about Him. Now your heart is overflowing with God's love for you. Now you understand how valuable you are to Him. You understand how He took the initiative. He went first. He reached out over heaven's balcony, and He brought you into a restored relationship with Him. Now you're brimming with unquenchable gratitude and inexpressible joy, and that love for Him just keeps increasing and increasing. You love God more than you used to, and because you love Him more, you love others more too. You love Christians more than you used to. Used to think that all Christians were judgmental. Used to think they were all hypocrites, that they were all weird, too fanatical, too extreme. And you don't feel that way anymore. Now you identify with Christians. Now you look forward to being with them for worship, for learning the word, for fellowship. Now you feel solidarity with the family of God. And you love people in general more too. You're more compassionate than you used to be. You're more forgiving and less vindictive than you used to be. You're more caring and kind than you used to be. Your love is increasing more and more, and that's clear evidence that God made the right call about you. How do I know God made the right call about you? Your faith is growing, your love is increasing, and your hope is persevering in spite of persecutions and pressures. Paul had to give credit where credit to God was due. He had to say it. God made the right call about the Thessalonians because in spite of many persecutions and all the pressures of life, they were persevering in hope, and so are you. In spite of all the world's criticisms, you are not pulling back from following Jesus. You know, so far the persecution that we face here in America, it's far less severe than the believers in Thessalonica. They lived with utter contempt of society. They lived with false accusations, harassment. They lived under extreme economic sanctions. No one wanted to do business with them because they loved Jesus. They lived under the constant threat of arrest and capital trial. They were targeted. They were being carefully watched everywhere they went and everything they did. Beloved, can I tell you that today, all around the world, there are believers who live under the imminent threat of being beaten, of being sexually assaulted, of being tortured, and even being martyred for their faith. Came across a story by CBS News published in January CBS News estimated that last year in 2013, 8,000 people around the world were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, martyrdom is sharply on the rise in Africa, in Arabia, in the Middle East. It is estimated that as many as 70,000 Christians are in concentration camps in North Korea this morning. We need to pray for them. By comparison, the derision that we face here in America seems pretty mild. 
And yet I would tell you that behind that derision is precisely the same demonic influence that wants to intimidate us and silence us and quench our faith. Even here in America, the pressure to back down, the pressure to back away from publicly confessing Christ, it's spiritual in nature. It operates through fear, and it is very, very powerful. And yet, here you are. You're not pulling back from worshiping Jesus. You're not pulling back from the Word of God. You're not pulling back from the family of God. And even more than being in here on a Sunday morning, every day you are out there living boldly for Jesus. Every day you're out there sharing Jesus, confessing Christ with anyone who will listen to you. See, that's really the perseverance of hope. It's not merely hunkering down in here with other believers. It's getting out there and proclaiming Jesus in spite of all the forces of hell that are putting pressure on you to sit down and to be quiet. Your hope is persevering. You're not pulling back in spite of persecution and in spite of all of life's pressures, you're not turning back. See, not only do we have persecution to deal with, but we face all the pressures of life. Pressure in family relationships and friendships, financial pressure, pressure in our career, pressure from all the incidents of life, accidents, injuries, pressure from aging, from illness, from losses, from grief. In the parable of the sower, Jesus called those pressures of life the thorns that choke the spiritual life right out of some people, but not you. In spite of the pressure, you haven't succumbed to self-pity. In spite of the pressure, you haven't given in to the temptation to blame God, to question His goodness or His love. You haven't turned back. Here you are. In spite of the pressure that you're facing right now in your life, you're still growing in your faith. You're still increasing in your love, and you're still persevering in hope. And that is unequivocal evidence that God made the right call about you. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit today. God made the right call about you. Second, hold on. Listen to me. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Because God will repay you double for your trouble. Paul writes here very definitively, God is just. Job was a lover of God. He was a blessed man. But his faith underwent severe testing through persecution and through the pressures of life. But Job persevered in hope. And in the end, God repaid Job double for all his trouble. God blessed him with twice the wealth. God blessed him with twice the assets, twice the servants, twice the honor, twice the physical vitality, twice the longevity of life. I find it interesting, God didn't bless him with twice the number of sons and daughters. Why? Because God is merciful. (laughs) And God will repay you double for your trouble too. Isaiah said that Jesus, he will replace our shame and our disgrace with a double portion of blessings and everlasting joy. In 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul gives us a a glimpse of what double for your trouble looks like. What does double for your trouble look like? For one thing, Paul says, God will trouble those who have troubled you. Even while writing encouragement to us as believers... Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians 1 about some of the most sobering eternal truths. Beloved, listen to me. It is a deadly, serious thing to trouble believers. It is a deadly, serious thing to trouble the church of Jesus Christ. It's a deadly, serious thing to trouble God's ministers. You see, Jesus so identifies with us That however people treat us, God regards personally as their treatment of him. Whoever blesses us, blesses him. Whoever messes with us, messes with him. Listen, you ought to be fair to people and issue them a warning sometimes. 
when you can tell they're just getting ready to, to go off on you, when you can tell that they're just getting ready to unleash a verbal tirade on you, you need, ah, you need to issue a warning. You need to just stop and say, listen, I got to tell you one thing before you go. This is what you have to know. Whatever you say to me, you are saying directly to God because I'm his and he is mine. And he takes that real personally. You know, sometimes unbelievers are more sensible about that than believers. Sometimes we very casually lift our voices against one another. We criticize one another. We criticize churches and ministries and ministers. I don't like him. He smiles too much. I don't like him. He's too positive. No, no, no. L listen, even some unbelievers are more sensible than that. I've literally, in the last 17 years, I've literally been to hundreds of meetings at Town Hall about uh, our buildings, about phase one, about phase two. And I remember we were one night at a public hearing, and some citizens of the town came to complain, to speak in protest to our building project, our proposed plans. And after uh, the public hearing part was over, they move on to deliberation. That's also anybody can stay. And so the commissioners began deliberating. And one of the zoning commissioners said, I am not a religious man, but I am not going to say anything bad about the church. A very wise man. <laughs> but can I tell you, it's not our job to repay trouble to those who trouble us. Yeah. Our job is to forgive them. Our job is to let the love of God overflow in our hearts for them. See, we can't do that. In our own humanity, we just don't have the capacity to, to love people so much that we can repay their insults with blessings. But the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts and we're able to love people. We need to pray. Our job is to pray for those who persecute us. Stephen did that. Paul was once called Saul, and Saul stood and he looked on approvingly while they stoned Stephen to death. And with his very last breath, Stephen uttered a prayer of mercy and a prayer of intercession. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Where have we heard that before? The result of Stephen's intercession was that a little bit down the road, Saul got converted. Surely, while Paul wrote these lines to the Thessalonians, surely in the back of his mind, he remembered, while he's even writing the words, God will trouble those who troubled you, he remembered that nothing, nothing, nothing is too hard for the Lord, that even the worst persecutor of the church is not beyond the reach of God's mercy and grace and beyond the ability to be converted. Remember when I was in Kenya, I met a man from Somalia who had once been the leading imam in the city of Mogadishu, and in his mid-30s, he had a radical Jesus came and appeared to him. This man was heavily involved in jihad, killed many, many, beheaded many, many, many Christians, and Jesus appeared to this man, and this man who had become, one, who is one of the, the most uh, ferocious persecutors of the church, is now a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Surely Paul remembered while he was writing those words what a debtor to grace he himself was. Nevertheless, Paul does tell us if our troublers don't repent and turn to God, God will trouble them. Beloved, God himself will terrorize the terrorists. He'll impose such a spirit of fear on them, far more dreadful than the spirit of fear that they sought to impose on us. In the end, their lives will amount to nothing. They will have lived for nothing. God says, I will contend with those who contend with you, and I'll save your children. What does double for your trouble look like? Another thing I find, God will cut you some slack from the pressures of life. How many of you just say, God, I could really use a break right now. There's just there's some area in my life, Lord, I could, I could just really use a break. Amen. Paul said, God will relieve you in trouble. That word trouble means pressure. That word relieve it means to loosen the tension on a bowstring. You see, the pressures of life, they've left us strung a little too tight. 
They've left us a little too tense. They, they've stretched us out a little too thin. I, I said to Denise two weeks ago, you know, we, God bless us with three kids very close in age, and uh, our, our first two children were twins, and I, I thought twins were a lot of work when they were babies. I had no idea that they'd be much more work when they were 12. <laughs> And I said to Denise, I said, honey, I'm so tired. I'm always rushing. Do you know, you know that feeling? I'm always, there's always somewhere, uh, I'm one place and there's somewhere else I should be and I should be there now. There's so much pressure, but Paul says, God will send you relief. Hold on. It's not going to stay that way. God is going to cut you some slack. He's going to relieve the tension in your home. He's going to relieve the tension in your marriage. He's going to relieve the tension in the relationship with your kids, that financial pressure pressure that you're under that is just crushing you. God is going to send help from the sanctuary. He's going to send relief, that stress in your career. God is going to send relief to you. Be encouraged and hang on. Heavenly help, it is on the way for you. What does double for your trouble look like? Another thing I find is that Jesus will reveal himself exclusively to you. Hang on and listen, because this is some good preaching right here. Peter said that the grace of salvation that we have received is something so unique in all of the universe that the angels long to look upon it. In the throne room of heaven, the seraphim who constantly surround the throne of God have two wings with which they cover their eyes because they are not able to look upon the full manifestation of the glory of God. But Paul says that there is a day coming when Jesus will appear from heaven in blazing fire and he will marvelously reveal himself to those of us who have believed on him. Beloved, unbelievers will not see that beautiful revelation of Jesus. They won't be permitted to look upon him. Oh, they'll see him, but they're not going to like what they see. They won't be permitted to look on his face. They will be cut off forever from the presence of the Lord because they rejected Jesus. But Jesus is going to reveal himself exclusively to we who have believed. We're going to see something. We're going to be the first in all of the universe, in all of creation. We're going to be the first ones to see what we see. We're going to see God face to face. And when we see him, it is going to culminate the process that's going on inside of us. The very sight of his face is going to bring the completion of a transformation inside of us that no other creature has ever or will ever experience. John said it this way, it has not yet appeared what we shall become. In other words, what we are going to be transformed into, no one has ever seen anywhere in all of eternity. It has never been seen. But we know that when Christ is revealed, we shall become like him, for we shall see him as he is. In that moment when we see what no one else has ever seen before, our union with God is going to be fully consummated. We're going to become participants in his own divine nature. We're going to become participants in his own divine glory. This is not heresy. This is scripture. We're going to be united to God in a way that the angels never will. God will transfer his own nature and glory onto us. He'll share his glory with us. And then he's going to hold us up in front of all the angelic beings. And he's going to show what a glorious thing that he has made out of us. And no one will have ever seen anything like it before in all the universe. And when heaven, when Jesus holds us up and says, See, look what I made out of them. He's going to get even more glory because only God could have done something like that. When we see him, our present work of believing on him will be completed. Right now, the struggle is real, but it'll be all over then. The struggle against temptation, the struggle against the storms of life, the struggle to persevere and hope, it'll be all done. The weakness of our human flesh will be over. 
every last ounce of corruption from the fall will be removed from us when we see him, and then we will be untemptable. We will be uncorruptible. We'll be permanently innocent. If you think about that for a few minutes, it'll make you speak in tongues. We'll never again worry about faltering or failing him or falling away from him. We'll be confirmed forever in holiness. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he shall stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see him. I will see him and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit today. God made the right call about you. Secondly, hold on because God will repay you. Double for your trouble. Finally, this. Be encouraged because you're living on a prayer. Be encouraged because you're living on a prayer. Beloved, I want you to be encouraged. You have been prayed for. You're being prayed for right now. And you will continue to be prayed for. And all of those prayers will not fail to work on you. Paul wrote to the Romans, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. He makes intercession through us in alignment with the will of God. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul prayed that they would grow more and more in faith, that they would increase more and more in love. And now we read the follow-up letter and we discover that Paul's intercession had been effective. He prayed they would grow more in faith and we find they had more faith. He prayed that they would increase in love and they had more love. They became exactly what he prayed. In the same way, listen, catch this with your spirit because it'll just give you a little zip. It'll give you a little help. In the same way, intercession has been made for you and intercession continues to be made for you. And just like it proved effective for the Thessalonians, the intercession made for you, it's going to work on you. Jesus, your intercessor. He prayed for you during his earthly ministry and he's still praying for you now at the right hand of the throne of God. He's entreating the Father for you. Peter said that the patriarchs and the prophets of the old covenant prayed in advance for those of us who would become the recipients of the new covenant that would receive this grace of salvation. The apostles prayed in advance for us and their prayers are saved in golden bowls in heaven and they're still bearing fruit on the earth. Godly intercessors have prayed down through the centuries, the last 2,000 years of church history. Whenever they prayed for the future generations of the church, they prayed for us, and their prayers are still taking effect. That's why we need to pray it forward. That's why we need to pray for the next generation. That's why we need to pray for our kids and our grandkids until Jesus comes back. Right now, the Holy Spirit is directing intercession to be made on your behalf that's aligned to the will of God for your life. Apostles and prophets and intercessors are praying for you. Christian mentors, friends, the people that first you led you to, to Jesus, those that are in your support in life, that they, they've prayed for you, they're praying for you now. Your pastors are praying for you. Pastor Ruth is praying for you and God loves her and answers her prayers. I am praying for you. Be encouraged. You're living on a prayer. And through prayer, God will make you into everything that he's called you to become. Paul said, we constantly pray that God will make you worthy of what he's called you. See, God made the right call about you. He saw you and he said, yeah, he's one of ours. And what God called you, you will most surely become because prayers have gone up for that. Whenever God calls someone something, they must become what he calls them. When God called a barren old man a father of a multitude, he had to become a father of a multitude. 
When he called a stutterer or a spokesman, he had to become a spokesman. When he called a wimp and a wine press a mighty man of valor, he had to become a mighty man of valor. When he called a shepherd boy a king, he became the most glorious king in the history of the world. And everything God has called you, you're becoming day by day through the power of prayer. God has called you an overcomer. God has called you more than a conqueror. God has called you a world changer. He's called you the first fruits of salvation in your household. God has called you powerful in spirit, strong in mind, in the Holy Ghost. What God has called you you surely will become. Be encouraged because through prayer, God will fulfill every inner longing you have for goodness. Paul said, we pray that by his power, he might bring to fruition every good desire, every good purpose, every good longing of yours. Goodness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit inside of us creates the desire to be good. You know, I don't want to be bad. I don't want to do wrong things. I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to hurt people. There was a man named Jabez. His name meant he causes pain. And he cried out to God and he said, God, I don't want to cause pain anymore. Anybody there with me on that one? I don't want to be bad. I want to be good. I want to do what's right. I want to be honorable. I want to be a blessing to people those longings inside. Some of you, you struggled with, addicti with addictions. You're longing to be free. That longing to, to be free from that, that is the goodness, the longing for goodness that comes from the Holy Spirit inside of you. And Paul says that through prayer, God is going to fulfill those longings. Jesus prayed for you. He still is. The saints prayed for you. Their prayers are still viable. The Holy Spirit is directing intercession on your behalf and through the power of prayer, those longings after goodness, they're going to be fulfilled. Be encouraged because through prayer, God will make you successful in every faith venture that you undertake for his sake. Paul said, and we pray that by his power, God will bring to fruition, bring to fulfillment every deed prompted by faith. Beloved, listen, whatever you have undertaken, whatever risk, whatever you have set out to do because you love Jesus and you want to bless people, God will not let you fail in it. You will be successful in every faith venture. And listen to me, God is not going to let us fail. Harvest Time Church, is going to succeed. Harvest Time Church is going to bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. Our ministry to Greenwich, it's going to succeed. Our ministry in Fairfield County, it's going to succeed. Our ministry in Westchester County, it's going to succeed. Alpha is going to succeed. Cleansing Stream is going to succeed. Pathways is going to succeed. The Abstract College Ministry, it's going to succeed. The current student ministries, it's going to succeed. Children's ministries are going to succeed. Listen to me, I prophesy our Stanford campus, it's going to succeed. And it's not only going to succeed, it's going to supersede the Greenwich campus. Our Spanish congregation is going to succeed. Our Brazilian fellowship, it's going to succeed. Our Filipino fellowship, it's going to succeed. Messiah's house is going to see a huge harvest of Jewish people meeting Yeshua, the Messiah. The Good Friday worship celebration, it's going to succeed. We're going to lead people to Jesus. And listen to me, phase two, it's going to succeed. We're going to start the building. We're going to build the building. We're going to finish the building. We're going to move into the building. It's going to be even fuller than this building. How do I know we're going to succeed? How? Oh, because we're living on a prayer. Because I have the prayers of the patriarchs. Because I have the prayers of the apostles and the prophets and the saints. Because I have the prayers of intercessors. Because I have the prayers of my pastors. My spiritual mothers and fathers, they're all home with Jesus now. Almost all of them. But you know what? Before they took the trip home, they laid their hands on me. And they prayed for me. And their prayers are yet bearing fruit in my life. 
My mom, she's praying for us, and God likes my mom a lot. He answers her prayers. My father-in-law, he's the most godly man that I've ever known, had the privilege of knowing my mother-in-law. They're praying for us. Their prayers will not fail. We have the prayers of uh, our precious friends in the ministry. And more than anything, Jesus, our intercessor, He's praying for us. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's petitioning God on our behalf right now. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, ready to bring forth fruit in its season, ready to bring forth phase two in its season, ready to bring forth ministry in its season. His leaf will never fade or wither, and everything he does it shall prosper be encouraged be strengthened in your innermost being with strength from the Holy Spirit God made the right call about you hold on he will repay you double for your trouble and rejoice be encouraged because right now you're living on a prayer. Come on, would you stand up on your feet? Would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place.